We live in the ecosystem of bacteria. We're just a part of it. But these bacteria, they're all around us. They're on our kitchen countertops, they're on our farms, they're in our bodies, and yes, they're in our food. Some bugs are this close to being resistant to nearly every important antibiotic we have, and that's a problem. What it means is that if one of those bugs infects you, in the time it takes your doctor to find a drug that's going to work, you might be dead. Already, nearly 900,000 people a year and 100,000 deaths occur in hospitals from infections that are resistant to antibiotics. There are bugs like the one shown here, uh, MRSA, which is a kind of a super resistant staph bug. But more and more, the victims of these infections uh, develop those infections outside of hospitals, in our towns, uh, in our communities, in our schools. They're people that look healthy, at least before they get the infection. Uh, young parents and athletes like Brandon Noble from the Washington Redskins or Carlos Don, who died at age 12 from MRSA. As nasty as these bugs are, they could get worse. Some of them, if they get resistant to just one more antibiotic, they're basically unstoppable, unbeatable. And that's kind of scary. So it's a safe bet, looking around, that all the people in this room, that many of you, maybe a lot of you, will develop a, a resistant infection someday. We just don't know when, and we don't know who. Will it be me? Maybe my 11-year-old, Lucia. Maybe your family. We don't know. So I want to talk to you about what all of us together and each of us separately can do to change the way that all of us eat. To bring us back from this abyss, this future where antibiotics don't work. Since the first use of penicillin 70 years ago, we've known that using antibiotics will very quickly select for bacteria that are naturally resistant to antibiotics. And those resistant bugs, they quickly come to dominate uh, the environment that they're in. But what we didn't know, or what we didn't take to heart, was, the less, was this lesson. Instead, we just moved on from one failed antibiotic to the next new one. We went from penicillin to tetracycline, then to erythromycin, to ceftin and keflex, to vancomycin and cipro. And we really worked our way into a pickle, because now there's resistance to all those antibiotics, even the biggest guns. We failed to notice something else, too. We failed to notice that the bacteria are getting smarter than we are. They can hatch resistance to a new antibiotic in just a fraction of the time it took a drug company to develop and then market that antibiotic. The other thing we failed to notice is that the drug companies have basically stopped looking for new antibiotics. So let's see, no new antibiotics and old antibiotics that don't work so well. That doesn't seem like a very good equation. Even 10 years ago, few of us uh, also knew about the link between the meat industry and this problem with antibiotics that no longer work. We didn't know, for example, that the meat industry, which today raises about 9 billion animals for food every year, that antibiotic use was absolutely core to their strategy for how to produce these animals. Two years ago, uh, the FDA first collected data uh, from drug companies, and it was a shocker. What it showed was that 80%, nearly 29 million pounds a year of antibiotics are used in agriculture. 80% of all the antibiotics that we use in the country for whatever reason. Now what do we compare this to? The amount used in human medicine, just seven million pounds a year. And what's worse, is that over 60% of these 29 million pounds 
are the same medicines or nearly identical to the medicines that we use in human medicine. So there are things like penicillins and tetracyclines and erythromycin and sulfa drugs. Now of that 29 million, actually very few are used to treat sick animals. Instead, nearly three quarters, 74%, are antibiotics used in animal feed. None of these really, or virtually none, are necessary uh, for raising animals. But don't take my word for it. Listen to Russ Kramer. Within a, a couple of years after we, we put together a, a very intense operation, we were experiencing diseases, a lot of diseases. These pigs have not received any antibiotics in this herd for, for 14 years now. But the fact is that there's, you know, we don't have sick hogs here. We don't treat hogs here because we don't have to. And I contend that you know, when you concentrate a lot of biological organisms, whether it be rats, kids, or pigs, that you're going to have problems. So here's the good news. And I know, I'm sure by now you're desperate for some good news, right? <laughs> Russ clearly can raise animals without antibiotics and has been doing so for 14 years. On the other hand, the meat industry would have us believe that they can't raise animals that are healthy without antibiotics. So what do we make of this uh, dichotomy? It, it's a mystery, right? Well, I think it goes back to how animals in conventional systems are raised. They're raised in, in facilities that look like these, where the animals crowded close together, the manure is collected under the barns, uh, there's a lot of dust, there's a lot of bacteria, there's a lot of re uh, residues of antibiotics. They're not very clean. And in these facilities, then, uh, uh, the FDA approves antibiotics and feed for two particular uses. First, to make the animals grow faster on less feed. Huh, so that's not a healthy use. And second, they approve the antibiotics and feed uh, to compensate, basically, to control diseases, to compensate for the infections that are more likely from raising animals in these conditions in the first place. Oh, so now I get it. If you ask Russ Kramer, what he would say is, I changed the conditions that my hogs were raised in, and now I don't need antibiotics. But if you ask the meat industry, what they'll say is, uh, we can't stop using antibiotics because we need them for the conditions that we raise the animals in. So it's two different perspectives. So here's, well, it's kind of like uh, if my daughter we're in a hospital nursery that looked like this, with the babies crowded close together. And the head nurse came by and said, uh, gee, Dr. Walling, I'm really sorry, but we've got a lot of infections in the nursery. But we're not actually going to separate the babies at all. Uh, um, we're going to let them stay crowded together and breathing on each other. And instead, we'll just put some antibiotics in their bottle every morning. So here is the good news. The good news is that we know it needs to be do done. And it's not new antibiotics, and it's not praying, although both of those might help. Now, we know that antibiotic use is what drives the resistance that we're seeing. And so it's quite simple, really. We have to find ways to stop using so many antibiotics. We've been doing that for years in hospitals and other medical environments, but we've done next to nothing in agriculture. Uh, the FDA data. Uh, as I said, show that three quarters of antibiotics are used in animal feed. We don't need to be doing this anymore. Let's think about the problems of raising these animals in terms of resistance. It, it, it's not just the volume of use, it's that these conditions create sort of the perfect storm. The antibiotics that are used are used pretty much routinely over the life of the animal. Uh, for some of these animals, their entire lives. Next, the, uh, the antibiotics are put in the feed at a lower level uh, than if they were for sick animals. So they're not actually killing the bacteria. And then third, they're not uses that you need a prescription for. You can literally go online and buy a 50-pound bag of tetracycline. Uh, try it. You'll, you'll see. <laughs> One unfortunate result 
of this situation is that now we've got a meat supply that's frequently contaminated with bacteria that are resistant to multiple drugs. So I'll give you two examples. Just two days ago, we published a study that was the largest to date going out and testing supermarket pork for the presence of MRSA, this super resistant staph. And what did we find? We found that over 6.5% of the packages of pork had MRSA in it. Now what that means is that uh, the next pork chop you might buy is about two to three times more likely to have MRSA than your neighbor is. And if you go out to the store and buy a conventionally raised uh, chicken breast, the odds that that chicken won't have resistant bacteria on it are practically nil. We know that. So we see resistant salmonella on the meat. We see resistant E. coli. We see MRSA. Not a pretty situation. There's risks to farmers, too, from using these antibiotics. Uh, the risks, uh, like Russ Kramer, made his decision to stop using antibiotics because he contracted a resistant strep infection. It turns out that that bug was resistant to the same antibiotics that Russ was using in his pigs. That was the end of his antibiotic use. And finally, uh, there's a good reason to not use antibiotics for farmers because of the growing markets for those products. Here's Russ in the uh, lower left. Uh, he is one of a 1,000 farmers growing antibiotic-free meat for Applegate. Paul Willis, up in the upper right, is another farmer in Iowa growing antibiotic-free pork for Chipotle. They're among the thousands now who don't use antibiotics in meat production. And how are these two companies doing? Chipotle buys about 100 million pounds a year of antibiotic-free pork. Applegate is growing, uh, according to the CEO who's in the audience, uh, about 25 to 30% a year, uh, and has been since they were founded. And uh, Chipotle is one of the darlings of Wall Street. Their stock, since 2008, up about 400%. So moving the market, though, is really not enough. We also have to have policy. And the problem here is that the agency that regulates antibiotics and feed <laughs> has never taken a feed additive antibiotic on the market, and Congress has never acted to reduce antibiotics. And so we need something new. And so my prescription to you is for a food fight. We need to fight hard to make our chefs and our restaurants and our supermarkets carrying the kind of meat we want, meat raised without antibiotics, and we need to fight hard to get our policymakers to stop allowing our antibiotics to be overused uh, uh, by a few companies or a few large meat producers and undercutting them for the rest of us. So I invite you to join Healthy Food Action Network, which is creating a new voice to bring about these changes, not only in the marketplace, uh, but in public policy too. Thank you. Thank you.